So I was contemplating her presentation, and I do want to point out uh, something unusual. She does have a restriction in the right hip, which the right hip only extends at most 5 degrees, the left as much as 20. I believe that we can easily restore that motion, and we actually see that pattern fairly frequently. The unusual pattern is what we see on the other hip. Um, many of my clients present with restriction of hip extension on the right, and it's easy to restore, and I think driving a car is what brings that transient or temporary restriction. They also tend to be tighter in the external rotators on the right. However, what's unique about her presentation is she's very restricted in the left hip. She can only internally rotate 20 degrees on the left, whereas on the right, when she's supine, I can rotate the hip 45 degrees with a soft end feel. On the left, it's 20 degrees with a firm end feel. So that is a unique pattern, and I'll talk about a unique um, presentation of the thoracic spine and upper cervical. So now we're going to show that the tightness in the uh, in the pelvis. If I attempt to take up the slack through the pelvis, I can't. It's very rigid. It just feels like I'm pushing on a block of granite. If I attempt a side glide motion and I'm putting much more force than I would normally need to use, there is no side to side mobility no visible side-to-side -side mobility. And most clients, her age, her body type, her gender, would of course have a lot more mobility. I'm trying to spring on the ilium inferiorly, and the rest of her body is quite flexible. So this is, a, you know, it's a distinct restriction. Go ahead and line your stomach, and I'll do a few more spring tests on the pelvis. So when she is supine, um, you can appreciate that the right hip extends minimally. The left hip, very free. Okay? Looking at the posture of the pelvis here, I'm on the PSISs, and as I slide medially, I should fall into a sulcus, but instead I climb up, and this is her sacrum. I'm overline her sacrum, and those are her, that's her PSIS on the left. Sacrum is very posterior. In looking at her images, I recall I, I was looking at a lateral x-ray, and I made the comment that it looked as though there was the possibility of a posterior glide pattern of the sacrum. And I don't know if the x-ray actually shows that or if it just appears such. Uh, I'm trying to induce an anterior rotational force, and nothing happens. I'm pushing on the sit bone and trying to create a superior force. I take up the slack that's readily available, and I'm trying to double that force. Nothing happens. This is an inferior glide on the ilium. Nothing happens. I'm on top of the sacrum. I'm on the lower, lower half and I cannot take up the slack at all. I'm suggesting that this is a treatable property. It's, it's a mutable property. This is the sacral tuberous ligament, and here it feels like a bone. And anatomically, there is no bone in there. This is the area where I am. There's no bone. There's only soft tissue, and the sacral tuberous ligament comes from sacrum and onto medial portion of the ischium. I'm, I'm palpating right in here. So lower sacrum is right here. So sacral tuberous ligament comes off that lower sacrum. There it is. Feels like a bone. Sacral spinous is a little bit higher up. Okay, now that's soft tissue there, and right there is the ligament. That is hard because sacrum is, in, in my opinion, stuck posteriorly. What makes her presentation unique is that most most women that have a posterior wedged sacrum, a posterior glide fixation, they have to compensate because the posterior sacrum essentially makes them lean backwards a little bit. It shifts the, the center of mass posteriorly. They tend to then be bent forward, and so they hyperextend in the mid-thoracic and when they're supine, the upper body of the sternum is very, very tight. 
Same thing with rib number three and rib number four. In her x-rays, she has flex extension films of the thoracic spine. You can see that she has degeneration at two thoracic segments, mid-thoracic, and it looks as though when she extends in the lumbar and lower thoracic segment, it looks like she remains hyperflexed at about T6 or 7. Given those unique mechanics, and she does have two G degenerative segments at T6 and 7, um, T5, 6, and T6, 7 discs, her body is different than the typical person's, and therefore her compensation is a little bit different. Um, if I do gentle springing on her thoracic spine, you can see that I can induce some spring mobility, and when I let go, there's additional recoil. And as I move up, she's very stiff here, and I'm, and I'm far away from the usual T3-4 segment. So I'm going to arbitrarily call that T7, T6 or 7, and she's very tight there. Um, continues to be tight as I come up, and at the segment that usually is restricted, T3, she, she has mobility. If I spring the ribs, okay, first rib is here, second rib here, third rib here, third rib springs nicely, as does four, and then we get into number five and it becomes tight. I can spring it just slightly. I know you probably can't see it. If I come down to rib number six, absolutely no spring. So her body is compensating very differently than the average person. Go ahead and lie on your back and we're going to um, cover your face from the view of the camera. I'll step in front of you while you readjust. And uh, I'm going to bring that little device for you. Okay. So this is our informal way of... Uh, <laughs> protecting your identity head up a folded uh, a folded cardboard folder okay? okay all right so this is the manubrium which usually remains mobile and you can feel the sternomanubrial junction can you feel that little step off there mm -hmm. okay typically folks are restricted right here on the upper body of the sternum she moves well uh, descending a little bit she moves there Coming down lower, she's very restricted here. So she's much more restricted, similar as in the back, not at the usual three and four segments, but more at five, six, and maybe even seven. Uh, another way to demonstrate that is third rib is right here. Third rib springs nicely. It's usually very restricted. This is rib four. Then we come on to rib five, and, and I can't spring it with a normative force. The very last thing I want to point out, um, and I must add that, she does have a restriction of the first rib, and she feels like her clavicle is elevated on that side. And I've tested the accessory motion in the clavicle at both ends, and th the first rib is distinctly limited, uh, distinctly restricted. Whether I try and spring the rib posteriorly, or whether I come down on the medial clavicle, or on the medial part of the first rib or the posterior aspect, it does appear to be elevated throughout uh, that area. The OA joint with this pattern will typically hyperextend. And after I told Cindy that her presentation was very unique and that her upper cervical actually at the OA joint appears to be hyperflexed, she made the comment that the motor vehicle accident did in fact hyperflex her initially. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Any any additional comments you want to make? Um, I don't believe so. I, it just went this and this. Yeah. Did you feel like the forward was more forceful or do you feel like, do you just feel like the forward one is the one that caused the greatest injury? Um, the, I would, well, you know what? I think all of it was pretty forceful when it hit. It so felt like it. Forward and backward yes. had, yes. yes. Okay. Um, any reason to think that the forward force was more... So it was different than a rear-ended injury? Well, I got rear-ended. Okay. Um, and I um, and my neck just snaps forward and back so fast that it was in a blink of an eye. Okay, but it definitely went forward first. Oh, yes. Okay, all right. So usually the head and neck connection is hyperextended. However such that I can't 
I'm, I'm unable to flex it. When I grab the occiput and I attempt to gently flex it at the uppermost segment, it flexes very easily. Okay? If I place the heel of my hands in front of the ears and above, and I perform traction, I can see your whole body move re uh, very readily. Typically, that is restricted. Now, when I try to extend the occiput, so I'm lifting with my fingers at a, at a 30 to 45 degree angle this way, it's extremely rigid. So again, I can flex the OA readily. I can, I can flex this junction where head and neck connect very freely. I can traction that junction as well. But when I attempt um, to extend it, which usually would be restricted, There's no mobility with, with attempting to extend it. Another way is to come under here and just, just get right at the very lowest part of the occiput, and you can spring it in a, in a number of different vectors. I'm springing straight up, and now I'm coming onto the neck. I'm coming onto C1. There's no anterior glide motion there, and, and below that we start to move freely. So it's interesting. Uh, again, the point I was making was that she appears to have a flexion fixation in the upper cervical in the where the occiput and C1 articulate, whereas typically when someone has a posterior glide of the sacrum, typically they're actually hyperextended there. And um, it might be that we will treat the upper cervical in extension. So to wrap it up, we have a unique presentation in that your left hip lacks internal rotation it's not unusual for people to have that restriction on the right side, on the right hip, due to pedaling gas, pedaling gas when they're driving. You do have an extension restriction of the right hip, not uncommon with people who drive cars. Uh, excessive use of flexion of that hip. That's easily treatable. You do have the posterior wedging of the sacrum, but your restriction is not up at T3, T4 area and corresponding ribs and sternum but it's a little bit lower, more at, at uh, five, six, seven regions. And then lastly, you do have an elevated first rib. It's not too uncommon, but when you get to the OA junction, you readily flex at that junction and you don't extend, whereas most people are stuck in hyperextension. So my point with this, and one of the reasons I called it advanced concepts or advanced patterns, whatever my wording was, it was advanced concepts, unusual distal compensation. Uh, I think that title is very appropriate. So I tend to speak too much, so I'm going to stop right here, and we will film your response to treatment. Thank you.